The talk of tonight's, tonight's talk, the name of tonight's talk is the price of dynamic memory in C and C++. So how much does it cost to use dynamic memory in terms of, of time, in terms of time, not in terms of, of, of memory consumption and so on. So I think this will be an interesting talk for, I think all the engineers that are doing in C++ should have some kind of, some kind of idea about the price of dynamic memory. So a few words about me. I'm Ivica Bogosadovic. I'm from Serbia. I'm a software engineer with 10 years of experience, mostly in embedded systems and, ap and application performance. I write about application performance. So I have a website, so you can see it lower the, at, at the footnote of the slides. You can see the addresses for the website, for the Twitter. If you want, you can send me an email. So I write about application performance. So I don't write about system performance. So why your programs are slow and techniques that you can use to speed them up. So if, if these are the topics that interest you, so feel free to, to follow Johnny Software Lab on Twitter and LinkedIn as, to get notified when I post new content. So that is it about me. Okay, a short introduction about the 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 the, the two types of programs when it comes to memory usage. So there, there are two types of programs when it comes to memory usage. The first type is uh, those programs that just allocate a few, mem maybe don't, don't allocate any dynamic memory at all, or they allocate a few large blocks from the, uh, from the allocators, and then do, they do this kind of processing on them, either sequential or random access mode, doesn't matter. So one example of that one is an image processing program. So it's uh, during its lifetime, it will allocate a few a few large buffers to hold intermediate data, oh, but only few of them. So and these are programs that are not interesting to us. And typically, th there aren't many programs nowadays that work like this. The other type of programs are the programs that allocate many blocks during the program lifetimes. Uh, these are the programs that keep information in random access data structures. In C++, these are trees, these are hash maps or sets, as I call them, maps and so on. Maybe your system has uh, its own custom container that also allocates memory in, in small chunks. Uh, also, if, even if you're not using these uh, random access data structures, if your program uses unique pointer, shared pointer, it calls new free, your program is actually allocating and deallocating memory. And those things can actually be a, a performance issue. So programs that allocate, deallocate or access memory in random access fashion can suffer from performance degradation and later we'll see how and why. So any questions until this point? Please let me know if I'm speaking too fast or some, you don't understand some parts, so I can explain them. Okay, moving to the next slide. So question is, why is your program that uses dynamic memory slow? Why is your program that allocates memory from the heap slow? So if you allocate and the allocate memory in many small chunks, uh, performance of malloc, new and free delete can be a bottleneck. So malloc and free are on in C, you can use them in C++. Typically, C++ you use new and delete, but you also implicit unique pointers and shared pointers use new and delete. So when you when you when you want to see why your program is slow, you will run a program called a profiler. Profiler just records the execution of your program and can, can tell you which functions take more time, which functions take less, less time. I'm not going to talk about performance tonight. Uh, but the performance output of your test that you're running will tell you if, if you see that the functions that take a lot of time are uh, malloc and free or new and delete, that can be, a, that can be a, an indicator that uh, your program is taking a lot of time in those, if it takes a lot of time in those functions, then if you speed those things up, then you'll make your program run faster. That's one part of the performance uh, related to uh, relate, uh, the, uh, dynamic memory and performance, the performance of allocation, deallocation. But the other thing that is also important is how, if you, how you access your data structures. So if you're accessing your data structures in a random access fashion as a tree, hash map, 
allocated objects and so on, the performance will suffer due to data cache misses. I'm gonna talk about data, cache, data caches a bit later, uh, but the thing about this is you will see that your program is slow in the prof profiler output, but you won't understand why is it slow. Those things will miss from those graphs. If you want to know that, you need to, you need to understand the data caches and you also need to understand you also need to understand some other things in order to perform that kind of analysis. And typically C++ developers don't have that knowledge. So they're not taught that. You don't learn that in university. Okay, moving to the next slide. About the allocators and the allocation process. So first part of the talk, we'll talk about allocators and the allocation process. So why are your, why are your calls to new and free, why are they slow? Uh, the allocator is a part of, this, of your program that implements malloc and free functions, and that allows your program to allocate and deallocate memory on demand. How it is important to understand how allocators work internally, in order to guess, in, in order to understand what are what are the, the the challenges there and how you can help them help fix them. So allocators internally ask. Allocator as a component internally asks for a large block of memory from the operating system. So typically the allocator will ask one megabyte, four megabytes, 10 megabytes of memory in a block. And then it will chunk out small pieces of memory when you request them. For example, if you request a memory chunk, which is 24 bytes in size for one instance of your class, the malloc will return that and it will take it from the large memory block it got from the operating system. So in order, this process of allocation needs to be fast and finding the chunk of right size inside this big block is not an easy task. Uh, you can, you, you, if you want to do it fast, you need, you need to do it cleverly if you want to do it fast. Okay, any questions up to this point? Okay, uh, in the next few slides, we'll talk about how allocators in how the allocators are implemented and one challenges they face, because this will help us understand why the allocation is slow and what are the strategies that we can use to mitigate this. We will also talk about off the shelf allocators. So allocators that you can download from the internet, compile and use in your application. If you, in some cases, this is a, this is a road you might take. Occasionally, you might want to implement your own allocator for a specific, specific application. Uh, and we'll talk about that too. The next part might seem a bit boring, but uh, as an exper experienced developer should know how allocators work internally because it was, this will allow them to understand why their programs are slow. So moving on. The first thing about memory allocation, general dynamic memory is this. Your program is running for some time. Is it is allocating, deallocating mem memory, allocating, deallocating in some kind of pattern? As the time progresses, it gets more and more difficult to find an empty, uh, 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 an available chunk of the right size. This is called the memory fragmentation problem. Now, if you look at this image, you see th this is a heap. This is a big chunk of memory, and the things that has, that that are colored in green are taken, and the things that are colored in white are available. So the allocator need, needs to go through through uh, uh, needs to go through through this through this um, uh, through, the, through this big block to find if you for example I want the I want a I want a chunk which is four of these tiny 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 blocks in size the allocator needs to find one which is available so it can take the first available and there are several strategies which one to take. But the problem with this is as your pro program is running, it is allocating, deallocating, allocating, deallocating, the, the time the allocator needs to get a chunk of appropriate signs is longer. So as your program is running for a long time, this the, the allocation, the allocation will be will be slower. So this is a serious problem for the long running programs and systems. And sometimes it might happen that your system actually has available memory but it doesn't have it as a large chunk and the allocation might fail. I remember when we were doing a TV box programming, we had a system that was changing channels every, 
uh, every 10 seconds. So, and it was running through the night. It was changing 24 hours, it was changing channels. And after 24 hours, it took the image 10 seconds to appear. And at the beginning, it took this image one second to appear. And this was the reason why it was this, why, why this was the problem with memory fragmentation. The system took more and more time to allocate available memory. So this is a problem in a long running systems. I guess some of you might have seen this in your, in your, sometime in your careers. So how do we tackle memory fragmentations problem? Well, the first thing is to use to, to call malloc and free less or less frequently. So in case you're programming in C++, plus one of the idea is to use vectors of objects instead of vectors of pointers. Now the question is how to deal with virtual functions in a vector of diverse objects, but we'll leave that to, we'll answer that question later. What we can also do and what's typically done in embedded system that, systems that, uh, that are long running ones is they occasionally restart your, uh, restart their prog programs. For example, I know for sure that my television restarts every time three, three o'clock in the morning. It restarts and then is, it is good as new. So no, no memory fragmentation issue, issue after that point. What you can also do is you can pre-allocate all the needed memory at the program beginning. This is also typically done in embedded systems or, or uh, because it works like this. For example, you say, my TV box can have a maximum of, of 1,000 channels. So you pre-allocate enough memory for 1,000 channels. And from that point on, there is no allocation. There is no deallocation. You can also do is you, you can cache memory chunks. So instead of when you allocate, when you first allocate memory chunks, you can you, you don't need to return them back with three. You can free, you can keep them and then you can reuse them. And that will Mm, that will make the, the allocate that will put less pressure on the allocator. And what you but also you can do you can use special memory allocators that promise low fragmentation. There are memory allocators that ac actually promise that they will keep the keep uh, low fragmented. So not every technique is applicable everywhere. Uh, and that's it. So moving on to the next yeah. a few a few people in the chat are yes. suggesting uh, several libraries, like the Emory Burger Mesh Library. Have you heard about that? No, yeah. Mesh yeah. Library. What are they doing? Uh, let me... Yeah, you just uh, unmute and tell us. I'm curious as well. Yes, uh, I'll unmute. Uh, I, I've only seen uh, CPP Con on it. I haven't tried to use it. But uh, I heard him saying that he's merging memory pages in a way that they are handling fragmentation in C++ and in C. So they have an algorithm, so you, you should use their allocators, and they are merging uh, memory pages in such a way that they are handling memory fragmentation. And what is the name of that? Uh, I can share the link of the... the the is that it's always possible to merge. Uh, he's a smart guy. He's the one that wrote Malok to, to no, begin. No, no, there, there, are, there is some use there. Since uh, uh, it's not uh, acceptable in most C++ program to move an allocated memory block, there is, there is use pattern that simply does not allow merging. The, the, the standard example is um, the uh, GCC implementation of SCD vector that uh, doubles the size every time it reallocates. And that leaves no possibility of reusing old, uh, reclaiming old memory. The memory allocation, uh, memory usage will always increase. Yeah. It, there, so, there are restrictions. I don't, I don't remember that. I, I haven't great. seen the video for a while. There are restrictions. I, something about virtualization and stuff like that. I don't remember it by heart. But, uh, but he, he says that he find a way to solve it. So I don't but know. I haven't tried it. I, I think that the vector has something like uh, change capacity. to. Re you can shrink also the, the, the size of the vector. It has some API, something like shrink to shrink capacity to actual size, size if 
if there is any memory given back to the operating system, I don't know. I guess that's the implementation of how the vector is implemented. But to be honest, if you have a 100 megabyte vector and then you shrink it to 50 megabytes, I think it would be possible to give 50 megabytes back to the operating system. It shouldn't be a problem in case of vectors, not in case of binary trees and so on. OK? Yeah. As far as I recall, uh, this library does interact heavily with the OS. And they do find uh, uh, two pages uh, uh, that, uh, first, that have uh, you know non, non uh, collo no collision between them on, on the allocated areas, and then they just copy them one on top of the other, and uh, reconfigure the the virtual uh, like the TLB and the, the, the translation look at the uh, structures such that both uh, what was once two different pages and now point to the same physical memory. Wait, I think I think I understand what you're saying. You're saying something like this. For example, I have two pages which are four kilobytes, for example, and inside one there is just one object which is on offset zero. And I have another page which is four kilobytes, and I have an object which is at offset, for example, 100. And now I'm merging those two pages into one pages, the offset zero. But you cannot do that. You cannot do that because you need to change the address at least one of them, right? No, you can map, map the same physical page to two virtual uh, uh, addresses. Like but that? I, I oh my God, what's the name of the thing? I, just yeah, I, I also yeah. don't know. But, but what I said earlier about a vector is something else. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, okay, but just, just, I mean, I want to finish the talk, but that things you're saying is really interesting and it's really, um, how do I say? It's really uh, something you don't you don't you don't see often. Okay, there's a link to the video and the library uh, in the chat room. I will say again, everybody is muted by default, uh, and you can't unmute yourself. But if you want to ask a question, just either ask on the chat or ping one of the hosts, and we will uh, un un or allow you to unmute yourself. Once. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Moving on. That was a nice, a nice, I didn't know that the thing exists. And it is a really problem because sometimes when you delegate a lot of code, there are just a few, few, a few bytes in each page that are left. If you can merge them into one page, that would be great. Okay, moving on. Uh, allocators, so one of the, the, the issues is memory fragmentation. The other one is the allocators and thread synchronization. So if the allocator internal uses one block of memory to allocate, memory to several threads, you need to, you need to protect the allocate and free with, uh, malloc and free with critical section with the mutex. And this does slow allocators down and uh, high performance allocators don't do that. Uh, many allocators solve this problem by using per thread memory blocks. So they have a one memory block per thread. And in that case, you, do, you get rid of the, uh, of the, of the, um, of the um, need for, um, for locking, for locks, but this increases memory consumptions, removes the synchronization penalty. So you're making a, we are making a, a, a trade-off between memory consumptions and speed. Uh, there is another problem: what happens if the program allocates memory in one block and releases it in one thread, and then releases the chunk in another thread? This creates a complexity for those allocators that use th those kind of uh, strategies. I found a really nice explanation. It's uh, how Glips, the, Gl uh, the Glipc library has uh, created a huge problem in a database database software and they replaced the allocator with some other one and then it fixed it. So who is inter interested, there is a link so you can read. Next thing, next thing you to know, need to know is memory allocation pattern. If your program is slow because it allocates in the allocates a lot of chunks, uh, you should understand your program's memory allocation pattern. Uh, so when I say memory allocation pattern, there are several aspects when I, and I'll talk about them. Um, the memory allocation factor, pattern actually influences the behavior of the allocator. So the way the, 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 the allocator be behaves, it depends on how you allocate memory. Uh, allocation pattern can tell you which kind of optimization you can use. So first question is, when does your program allocate memory? Does it, some, some programs 
take a look at this. Take a look at this. Uh, I just second pointer. So take a look at this at, at, at this graph. So the blue line presents programs that allocate everything up front. So at the beginning of the program, it allocates 11 megabytes of memory and then keeps this constant. And next thing, next program would be like uh, the one with the right line, which allocates in bursts. So it allocates a lot of chunks and then the, frees them. That allocates them again and that then gets rid, gets rid of them. So this is another access pattern. And those kind of, depending on the access pattern, you will use different strategies. Another access pattern is gradual allocation. The, 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 the memory consumption grows steadily and slowly during the program lifetime. So if, I guess at some time it needs to stabilize, but you see a growing pattern. So if, if, you, if you're allocating all of your memory up front, uh, you can pre-allocate everything. And this is often used in embedded systems and real-time systems. If you're allocating in bursts, allocating, deallocating, allocating, deallocating, what you can do is introduce caching. So what does that mean is that you allocate, but you, do, you don't give it back to the, to the allocator. You keep it on the side. You can also invest in a good allocator. So there, there is a selection of allocators that you can use. You can use custom allocators for containers. The yes standard library allows you this. If you have a gradual allocation, then you should use a good allocator. Just pick a good allocator. So moving on, I just said that the standard library allows you to overwrite allocators for all, all the standard containers, vectors, maps, unordered maps, and so on. So you can use template mechanism to, to allow to provide a custom allocator. This is a good choice when a data structure, structure performs a lot of small allocations. So if a data structure internally uses trees like maps or sets, then this is a good, good idea. Uh, in that case, the data structures gets its own block of memory from the operating system, and then it allocates and deallocates memory from that dedicated block. When the when the data structure gets destroyed, that allocator can so your custom allocator can return the whole block back to the operating system, so you don't have the memory fragmentation problem here. Have you ever used the custom allocator? Yes. Yes. And you, if you are into performance, you'll use them a lot. So if you're game in uh, inside, if you're working for game development, uh, low frequency trading, you'll use ca custom allocators. And you'll see I, later pers that. Personally, I prefer to you to use a global slab allocator or something like that. Yeah, uh, that works. This is a, that generally that works. But when performance is important, you'll see that using a custom allocator can give like thirty percent performance. Okay. Uh, so custom allocators. So here's an example of a custom allocator. We call it zone allocator. So what is a zone allocator? It's a nice allocator, which when created, it just uses MMAP. So MMAP is a system call on Linux to get a large block of memory from the operating system. So when destroyed, it uses MUNMAP. So it returns the whole block. And you see on the right side here, there are two methods. One is called allocate, but just, so this zone allocate works always with the same size of same, the, the, the size of the, 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 the chance you're allocating is constant and it's known in compile time. So you're just taking a first available block, first available chunk and just returning it. So this thing doesn't even implement the allocate. So, um, what is the use pattern for this? So the use pattern, usage pattern is, for example, you have a binary tree and you're overwriting it with the custom allocator. And you know when you destroy, this tree will be short-lived. short, short -lived. It will get destroys, destroyed early. You will use it for some time then destroy it. And then you say, okay, I'm not going to implement the allocate. I'm not going to return chunks back to the big block. When, 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 when this zone allocator that gets destroyed, that means that the data structure got destroyed, so you can return everything back, back with the M map. So wh why not use uh, malloc and free? Performance. It's always performance. We're talking about performance. Why, why would this be faster? Why would this be faster? Well, first, first thing is you have less fragmentation. No, I don't mean to, to allocate every object. I mean, why not allocate the huge chunk with malloc? Sorry? 
Ah, oh, you can allocate few Changju to alloc. You don't need to use my map. You can use malloc as well. But internally, it will use my map. Okay. Uh, questions. That was the question that uh, that Avi asked, and yeah, you can. I, I answered. So you can use malloc if instead of m map and m, m and map. This was just an example on how to do it. M map gives you a bit more control. So, for example, if you are if you're only allocating a large a large buffer, say 100 megabytes, that will hold a temporary data that you'll write only once. You will use it only once, and then you will deallocate it. So, if you're using malloc, it will return a block. But if you're using M map, you can say that you can ask from the operating system to allocate the memory for the block. So not use sec fault, uh, page faults. So I don't know if you use MMAP, I'm asking 1000 megabytes in this case. The operating system won't allocate one gigabyte of memory for my, for my data structure. But when, when I'm starting to write to those blocks, when I start to write to those blocks, the, the, the operating system will take over and it will actually allocate a physical page in memory, okay? And uh, this is cool when you're using this kind of allocator where you don't know how much memory the system will use. But if, for example, you know that will use one gigabyte of memory and you will use it for a really short amount of time, then you can, you can provide another parameter to MMAP that will, let, will, will tell the system to allocate, actually allocate that one gigabyte of memory. And this will run faster, not much faster, but faster. Okay. Is everybody following me? I'm, I, I think I'm go, going too much to uh, talking a lot of unrelated things. Just write down something in the chat. I just, I don't see the chat. chat. I, think I think we're good for now. Everybody's following. Okay. 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 Okay, we are done with custom allocator. So how does your allocation and the allocation pattern look like? So you have here two different patterns. So one is that the it's oscillating, growing, and the other one is the you're allocating few chunks, then the allocating few chunks, and so on. Um, okay. So I already explained about memory caching in case of when you're allocating few chunk and the allocating few chunks, actually you're keeping around, you're, you're, you're actually using just a little amount of memory, but that uh, uh, alloc free, alloc free, alloc free together in the system that allocates and the allocates memory can create problems with cache, chunk caching is not a bad idea. Uh, so example is a producer consumer. If you have a class that produces and sends some data to the consumer, producer if producer uses malloc to allocate memory and the, the, the consumer uses free to deallocate memory, in that case, you can have memory fragmentation. And idea, ideally, you would like the producer will just send, uh, the, the, the producer will send, in that case, you can implement chunk caching by, 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 by um, so the, the, there, are, there are like 10, 20 or 30 chunks that are always available for allocation. In that case, the citizen doesn't need to do allocation, the allocation. So here's an example of that. We have a class chunk and I overwrote here, uh, operator news and operator delete. And in this case, I'm counting ch chunks. I have max chunk count, which is 30. So if, my, I have a list which is a uh, which is a um, um, which is a linked list of available chunks in the chunk cache. So if the first chunk is available, in that case, I'll just remove. I'll just return the first chunk. If not, then I'll call malloc and delete. If the current chunk count is less than thirty, in that case, I'll put the chunk which is being deleted into the list. Otherwise, I'll call free. So this is a simple implementation of caching. And it can actually help performance of your program. OK, other things to keep in mind. Does your program allocate memory in many small chunks or few larger chunks? Is memory allocated and deallocated in the same order? So if you're allocating blocks in one order, then you should deallocate them in the same order, because that keeps the fragmentation in place. The fragmentation doesn't grow. If you're just 
allocating in one order and then the allocating randomly the thing the thing that will happen is that you will increase the memory fragmentation uh, does your program allocates memory in one thread and then delay it allocates it in another thread this can cause also lower performance is your program a long running one so if you have a long running program you might want to restart it but if you have a state of the programs then you should consider implementing the ability to save your program state to a file and then restart it and then load the states back from the file uh, also one of the way to avoid memory fragmentation is to use allocation pools so each chunk size is allocated from a dedicated block so here is a allocation pool if you see this so you have one block for eight byte chunks, and then you have another block for a 16 byte chunks, and you have another block for 24 byte chunks and so on. So you don't, you go up to some certain level and then you, you, you don't create anymore. Like you don't create list of chunks for four megabyte chunks. So this is a good idea because it prevents mem memory fragmentations, but again, it increases the memory consumption. Some allocators internally use something like this. I think I think there is a, a new container proposed for the C++ standard library called the Colony. Uh, it's actually a, a several containers which implements this kind of skip list, but I think the skip itself is all of one complexity and not all of uh, n complexity. And uh -huh. it gives you very stable iterators and it's exactly the kind of thing that you could use to manage this kind of skip list very efficiently. How is it called? Yeah. It's called colony. colony, colony something, colonies. From Matt, <laughs> Matt, Reed, uh, Matt Bennett, I forget his name, mm -hmm. he's from New Zealand. It's gone through a lot of revisions, uh, but it's definitely worth checking out if you're thinking about, if you need um, a stable and efficient uh, uh, containers for this kind of thing. Yeah, it's, I guess it's a vector base, right? No, it's, a totally, it's, it's different. Sorry. It's kind of a skip list yes. with uh, uh, O of one complexity for lookup. Yeah, 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 that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. So uh, if you have a, uh, that's used a lot, for example, if you have a unsorted list of objects and then you want to remove, but so from the performance point of view, linked lists are bad. So STD list is really bad and you don't want to use that. So that kind of when you, for example, you have an unsorted list of objects and you want to remove one and then you take one from the end and put it in the place of the one that you removed, something like that. And this skips lists are also, you have a list of available places that you can, in case you're removing them, then you, when you get, give them back, this is all for the performance engineer, this, these data structures are really good. Actually, everything which is vector-based is really good. Ivica, I have a small question. When I write my own custom allocator, do I need to uh, take care or, or make some consideration regarding alignment? Or can I return uh, any address that I want? Uh, you should return, I... okay. That's a complex question. You should return on 64 bits, you should return 16 bytes, 16 bytes aligned chunks. But if you want to take advantage of, of SIMD, then you should, they turn probably 32 bit align, 32 bytes align or bigger. Okay, but the standard uh, asks me to do it 16 bytes align. Yeah, yeah that the standard is uh, eight bytes aligned on a 32 bit architecture and 16 bytes aligned on on uh, on uh, 64 bit architectures. Thank you. And one more thing, uh, this entire thing of uh, using allocators, it doesn't have anything to do with the uh, the actual uh, constructors, destructors, RAI, etc. Right? Uh, um, no, the, no. The... no, no, no. Uh, allocation is one thing, and construction, destruction is other thing. I don't know if you're familiar with the C++ syntax, but you can take a buffer, which is like a char buffer, and you can construct an object inside it. Okay? You call new, but inside the brackets, you specify the name of the block where you want to call your object, your object constructed. I can show you an example later on. When you're implementing data structures, you, you, you use that a lot. Okay, moving on. So off the shelf allocators, there are a few good open source allocators that you can use in your projects. 
no allocators is perfect for all applications. So allocators basically divide into low fragmentation. So you, low fragmentation, uh, high performance and low memory consumptions. So no allocator is perfect for all application and you need to test them and uh, see which one fits your needs. Things to keep in mind, allocation speed, since I'm talking about performance allocation speed is important for me. Memory consumption. So some of the memory will get wasted because each block has some metadata related to it. That's one thing. And also sometimes happen that the, alloc that the allocator allocates a large block of memory, but it is unable to provide that memory back to the applications. And then you have wasted memory. Uh, this is also taking some, some allocators are more memory consumption oriented, not speed. And for example, in embedded systems with low memory, uh, with low memory, uh, we don't have a lot of memory. Also the problem of memory fragmentation. It is important for all of long running applications. And the last thing is locality of reference. If you call two times malloc, consecutive two times, call malloc one, malloc two, two times, you expect to get neighboring memory chunks. And this is really important for our C++ developer. You'll see later why. Because when you're, if you're allocating objects for a vector of pointers, if you don't get them neighbor, neighboring chunks, the performance can be disaster, really can be bad. Okay. I have um, a yes. So when you're writing a custom allocator, are okay. you taking into consideration alignments of cache, like line cache and stuff like that when you're writing a cast a custom when you're writing a custom allocator to be used for the stl so what you're doing you're not writing a full-blown allocator that needs to deal with everything you're writing an allocator that basically just deals with one type of object for example they're all objects are 40 bytes in size and then you don't have to worry a lot about the other things there is no multi-threading shouldn't be any multi-threading unless you're allocating in several threads so the, 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 your task is much easier. You should return 16 byte aligned blocks. Uh, that is something have... you should do. Otherwise it might happen that you lower the performance and you can see if you're profiling your application, if you're using the hardware pro profilers like Intel's VTune or, or IMD, yeah. IMD's Microprof, they will tell you if you have misaligned accesses in your application. And that does slow down, but on, not on Intel's architectures, but the AMD's architectures or smaller CPUs that can slow down your program. Uh, I have a question, Joe. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm curious to hear your input on the following. Uh, I witnessed at the time uh, memory problems with the Python 2 allocator. The way it was allocating the Python itself, it uses um, cache blocks, uh, uh, pools, memory pools for uh, allocations of the same size. Uh, the problem is when you have a pattern of allocating a lot and lot of stuff, and then some of this stuff uh, gets released, but not all of it. So you wind up with a lot of partly full uh, pools because almost neither of them gets completely empty. They are not returned back to the operating system. So you wind up filling up your uh, virtual address space. Okay, uh, okay. How, how do you uh, address such a problem? Okay, let me just uh, make a short summary of that. So I read there is a site called IT Hair. It's a really good site because it's really, the language there is really colorful. The guy doesn't write there anymore, but he gave an example. If you, if you allocate like 100 megabytes of objects, each one is 40 bytes in size. And then you al de allocate 99% of those objects, but randomly. So one of percent of the objects is kept. How much memory do you think, how many pages do you think you can give back to the operating system? Almost none. In my experience, I, I, th I think you can give back maybe around 20 megabytes. So most of the pages will still contain one or two objects that will prevent you from, from giving them back to the operating system. Exactly. Okay. So uh, how do you call this? This is the place when you want a custom allocator. For example, if you're, uh, if you're having a lot of data structures, then each data structure gets its own dedicated block. When the data structure is deleted, 
then this thing is returned back to the operating system. But there is no there is no known solution for memory fragmentation that will work every time. Okay, this will always remain a problem with us. Uh, okay. Somebody mentioned that uh, TBB, the Intel threading building blocks library, has a malloc that gives you a compile time flag, uh, which allows you to have objects which are aligned to cache lines. Great for preventing false sharing. So I'm just quoting. Shall wait, we? Wait. You're welcome to say more. So T, I don't know about TBB, I never used it. False sharing is typically rarely a problem, at least I didn't see it a lot. So the, if you it want to- It is that uh, if you have- uh... oh. Hello? Hello? I, I, I did, I, I, I you can hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, um, so uh, the thing uh, that I read about in TBB is that if you want multi-threads, multi-core to work on your, on your data, you don't want them to read or write the same cache line. So you want your objects to be in a different cache lines. So each core would have its own part of your data. So I, I didn't check it in real life, so maybe it's, it's not something that happens a lot, but um, for Intel uh, architecture, <laughs> architecture as there is something called false sharing, it's uh, it's um, it's about the cache coherency. When one core change change uh, place in memory, every other core that needs that part will need to uh, to um, to get the cache line again. Yeah. So yeah. if you so, uh, so I can tell you I can tell you a few things. I don't know about the the TBB. I can tell you a few things about false false sharing. So if imagine if you have a class. And inside a class, you have two members. And one of the member is accessed from thread one and the other member is accessed from thread two. Now, they are independent. You don't need any mutexes. As far as that, you don't need any mutexes because they are independent. But what actually happens is that two, those two data members, they correspond to the same cache line. And every time one CPU changes a cache line, the other CPU needs to invalidate its own copy and load it again. And this will cause a slowdown. Now, I think the perf tool, so this is a perf, is a performance performance uh, monitor tool, has a inbuilt support so you can detect false sharing. And also VTune also, the Intel's VTune profiler also has abilities to detect false sharing. But in my, in my, um, I mean, I, I wrote something, I wrote an article about false sharing and it was really, messy to create the conditions because the compilers are actually good at optimizing away false sharings and, and that doesn't happen a lot. And you shouldn't worry about false sharing. That happens really rarely comparing to the things I'm talking about. Thank you. Well, it, it happens more commonly if you're using log-free algorithms. But um, uh, I don't know, does STL have uh, log-free algorithms? Well, S STL no, but your own uh, code might. But, but then the allocator doesn't uh, go into it. But uh, I wanted to contest something you said that uh, memory fragmentation is something that no, uh, no allocation strategy solves. Uh, your block strategy actually solves that because all, all blocks, all continuous blocks have the same allocation size. And so uh, there's no problem, there's no merging going on and therefore there's no fragmentation. Uh, what I didn't understand. What did you say? Uh, uh, what what solves the BB? The 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 block uh, uh, allocator you showed a couple of slides back. Yeah, it solves it solves the fragmentation problem. But if you want to do it like that, you have to have for each data structure in your program, you have to have a special custom allocator, and that will increase the memory consumption significantly. No, you can use one custom allocation for the the whole program. Yes, the, but the memory, memory. Okay, I'm. I, I just. I mean, memory fragmentation can be slowed down. That's what I know. But to get rid of it completely, I don't know. Okay, I leave that to the other people. Okay. Oh, uh, I, I, I just want to say that, uh, like two weeks ago, I had a full sharing issue. 
Okay, okay. that uh, was solved by alignment, but but. Uh, so it was it, the, it tonight, happened because if you solve, if you solve it by alignment, you didn't solve it. You just messed it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's how I avoided it. No, no, no. You you, you don't you don't do that. You need to rewrite that part of the code that you have false sharing. I can. Uh, I don't want to hold you down, but I can share with you an example after that if you want. Can to. you send me an email because I'm just curious, uh, actually, to see a, a real life code that. I have. Simple. I have a better suggestion. Next time we'll have the show and tell, and now we will prepare the example as a slide. No problem. Do you want to come so next? Time? I think there are many people here who are really interested in seeing that example. Okay. Okay. And why it works and why it doesn't work. Yeah. Okay. No problem. Okay, I've, I'm finishing about the off-the-shelf allocators. You have them, you can download source code and you can run them. Now, standard C library it provides implementations of malloc and free and these are commonly available on Linux. There are other allocators on Linux and I'm talking about the high performance ones. This is not, they're not the only ones. There is a TC malloc from Google, GE malloc from Facebook, me malloc from Microsoft, Horde allocator, PT malloc and DL malloc. Now, they're installed. You can install them on your Linux system from the repositories. Uh, each of them makes certain trade-offs for speed and memory consumptions and locality of reference. There aren't any good, there, there is no perfect or bad. You need, to, you need to try them, measure a speed and compare them and see which one suits you the best. Now, hands-on, allocator come as libraries that you can either link against or replace them in runtime on Linux. In Linux, you can use LD preload LD preload environment variable to override the default allocators. You, you say LD preload, and then you put the path to the, to the allocator library, and then you run your program regularly. Now let's test the performance of few allocators. So we have the built-in in the, as part of the standard C library GNU, GNU Google's, Facebook's, and Microsoft's. So please place your bets in the chats. Which ones do you think will be the faster? So I'll, I'll, I'll run it. What's your, I think what's your test? Sorry? What, what code are you testing? Okay, let me open the code, okay? So it's, uh, okay, tell me if the, the, the windows is too small. Oh my God, it's this is great. Okay, I'm gonna zoom it a bit. Zoom in, okay. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a code that goes like this. So it creates, it has a class student, class subject, class professor. Then it creates some students, professor, student that array. So it, it creates a set and it creates a vector. So the set is the one that is allocating, the allocating a lot. It's not, the vector is not a problem. The set is what is a problem here. So we do, we do this in a loop of 1000 time. So, um, um, what we do is we, we generate 100 professors randomly and generate 100 students. And then we remove 60 of them. And we do that 1,000 times. Uh, okay. Sorry, I launched the poll. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, Sorry. no. I'm just putting it here on side. I'm going to vote. But it's not. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, you can we vote. I just by clicking, right? Yeah, nice. Yeah. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna, so this is the test. Uh, this is the test that we are going to run. So it's a simple program. Let's first measure how much time do we spend allocating, deallocating. So I'm gonna run it like I think it's already made. I'm, I'm gonna use perf record call graph dwarf. To measure, oh, no, it's called allocation test. Okay, now this thing will run for some time, and then we can see how much how how uh, how much time did we, did we spend in in the in the allocator and the allocator. Okay, let's wait until this thing loads, guys. I'm quite conf conf confident that we will not finish in 45 minutes. I can skip part of the detail of, of the material or we can make it longer. So it's up to you. Okay. As you can see here, 
I have 4% of the time passed in malloc. And uh, if I look at here, I have 2.5% of the time passed in free. So it's four plus two, around six, six point five percent. So it's not a lot of time that I'm I'm doing I'm I'm spending allocating in the allocating memory, but we will be able to see how much time how much time is spent here. Okay. Now, did you finish placing? Okay. Facebook is the fast. Google is the fast. Facebook after that, GNU and Microsoft. Okay, let's see. Make a run allocation test. Okay. I hope I run, I'm running it. Man, this is so slow. Okay, the first thing is no allocator. I'm using this multi-time utility that will run, for example, five times this program, and it will also report resource usage. So we can see how much memory the each of the allocators consume. So it's a nice things to know. So we're running with no allocator. That means we are using the built-in allocator. Okay. Will you show, will you share this code? So anyone can try it on their own machines? Yeah. So this one spend, uh, spend five seconds executing and it consumed 100 and 158 megabytes. So now we are running the Google's allocator, TC malloc. Suspense is killing us. So I have a question, if I may. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, so just me, while, while the program is running, um, so basically, a program can also do caching and like, like if you just repeatedly, you know, run a for loop that allocates and then the allocates, etc. So you could get like cache and and optimization. That's you know, it's not it's not really an allocation the allocation. So like, so how would you write it? Uh, as far as I know. So if so. you want to use cache, cache, chunk caching, you would overwrite new and delete operators. I give an example in the slides. So this is how would you do? I mean, there is also the other thing that you could do is that you can use. So I already explained to you that you can allocate. So in the syntax of C++, when you call new an object, then it will do one, two things. It will allocate memory and then it will call the constructor. Yeah, no, I maybe I'll I'll fix my question. What I try to ask is the benchmark. How uh -huh. do you how do you make the benchmark not use cache? I, I mean, as far as I know, the program would be optimized, and the benchmark might use the do the caching. So that that's my question, actually. I you mean in this particular case? Yeah, for example. But I'm not recompiling the application. I'm running the same application. I'm just using LD preload to try different allocators. Uh, multiple times, I assume? Yeah, yeah. Like, so I, okay, so maybe I'll just uh, see the, the code and that will answer the question. I just, as far as I understand, uh, where, when you for loops, uh, when you allocate in, like, Allocate, then deallocate, then allocate, etc. Yeah. And you could get uh, uh, so the so the first allocations wouldn't be same, wouldn't have the same uh, timing as as the last one because the last ones because uh, because you you already have um, something on the cache from the program. But so I might I don't know internally how these allocators do. What kind of tricks do they use to to speed mm -hmm. things up? We're just measuring numbers now, okay? Okay, sure. So uh, as far as my program is concerned, it, it's not even aware that it's running on a custom allocator. Okay, let's see the numbers. So uh, GNU was, took five seconds and it spent 158 megabytes of RAM. The next one is, uh, is uh, Google's, which took 4.7 seconds and it spent 163. So it was faster, but it spent more, me more memory. The next one is uh, JMalloc from Facebook, which 
was a bit slower than the standard built-in allocator, but it consumed a considerably more amount of memory. And the last one was last one was Microsoft's, which took eight four point eight seconds, and it spent a lot of memory. So as far as I'm concerned, in this particular case, the winner is the Google. So it took the least amount of time and just a bit more memory than the built-in allocator. So the performance of these things you will actually see uh, when you have, a, first you need to profile and see that you actually have a problem with the allocation and the allocation. And from that point on, you can, you can try changing the allocators. It won't, you can change allocators as much as you like if there is no performance problem in the allocation, okay? Okay, so let's see the, re the results. Uh, Facebook, so Google, most of people got, got it right, five people. So it was nice. Um, uh, that's it. Moving on. So we are finishing. So this is the end of the talk related to the memory allocators and mem memory allocation. The next part of the talk is related to uh, the performance of using the memory. So your, your allocator actually gave you the memory chunks or you got them some, somehow maybe they're from the stack and so on. Now you're gonna, you want to use them. Now does, it, that, does that come with a performance price? So your pro program's performance actually depend on the way you're accessing memory in more specifically. How is your data laid out in memory? And the second thing, what is the access pattern to your data? So how you're accessing. So imagine lay, lay, data layout, for example, vector. You have a vector and you're accessing sequentially going from the beginning to the end. So the data laid out is linear and the access pattern is uh, also linear. And this is the perfect example, the, the best case. But for example, you can have a vector again, which is sorted and you're doing binary search on it. So you have a sorted vector, but the binary search actually, you're not accessing it linearly, you're accessing, accessing, accessing it randomly. Uh, okay, now if you're interested in performance, generally in the, the, the software performance, you'll see that the abstractions that people who are developing software really like, you sometimes you need to break them. Now simple abstractions of malloc and free that doesn't, don't take into account underlying hardware doesn't cut for the high performance software. So you can achieve the best performance only if you understand how the allocator works and you can fine tune how it works. So it works the best for your own case. And we'll see later examples when you actually do that. The question is, why does the program speed depend on memory layout? So memory speed is a bottleneck on modern systems. So if, if you are new to, to development, you should know that it's not the, the slowness of your program uh, most of the time doesn't come from the computation, the lack of computational power on the CPU. Actually, CPUs have a lot of computational power nowadays, but they need to wait from da for data from the memory. And the CPU will typically spend around two to 300 cycles waiting for the, for the value to come from memory. This is the time that you can, the CPU can do 200 to 300 instructions, but it cannot do them because it doesn't have data to work on. To partially fix this, CPU designers introduced a small on CPU memory called the cache memory. So this is a really fast memory, which has, you, you can access it typically in three to 15 cycles. And this is a small memory CPU keeps data that is currently using inside this memory. Every access to, uh, so every access to the main memory begins by moving data from the main memory to this cache memory. All the access, every time CPU check goes, wants to access data in the main memory, it will go through cache. It will check inside the cache for, first. When the data in the cache memory is not used for some times, the cache memory, which is a hardware piece of device, automatically removes that that, that data back to the main memory and a process called eviction in order to make space for new data. Uh, the CPU has also a component called data prefetcher. So if the CPU can figure out the memory access pattern, it can prefetch data from the main memory into the cache memory before the data is itself needed. This is, for example, a case if you're 
going through an array linearly. So you're going 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and so on. The CPU can, CPU pre, the data prefetcher can figure this out and it can load, get data from the memory so you can use, so it is available for the CPU. It also happens if you're accessing like zero element, zero element, five element, 10 element, 15 element, 20, the CPU can also prefetch data in that case too. So another explanation for cache memories is analogy with books. So on your desk, you can have place for eight books. So you will keep eight books that you actually need. And the other books that you don't currently need, you will keep them in the library. If you need a new book, you need to return the, the least recently used book back to the library. So you're taking the book you don't need, no longer need and returning it back, back to the library. So if your library is sorted, for example, by author, so if you know the data, if you know the, the, the data pattern, so you know, for example, which next book you will be using, you can prefetch it. For example, you're writing about the topic according to the author, author name, you can just pick all authors that begin with A and get them on, on your desk. In that case, you don't need to go back to the library every time you need a new book. You can prefetch eight books and put them on your desk. And this is analogy with the cache memories, okay? Okay, questions about cache memories. It's important really to understand this. So the performance of your program can really depend on that and you'll see that later. There is one more thing about cache memories. Cache memories are divided into cache lines and typically on modern CPU systems that you have in your home, a line will, will be 64 bytes in length. So it will call 64 bytes of data. One line in the cache corresponds to a block of the same size in the memory. So 64 line of 64 bytes in cache corresponds to a line of a block of 64 bytes in memory. If you access even one byte inside the line, you will the, the hardware will, the, the 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 whole 64 byte line will get loaded into the cache. And you need to be aware of that because you need to organize your data like that. So when you're accessing one byte in the cache or one integer inside a line you want to access, your next access to be also in the same cache line because this will save, save, save some uh, cycles. So if access to one byte inside the cache lines means that the whole line will be fetched to the cache, access to any byte in the cache line is very fast. So if your program organizes their data like this, they'll be fast. Uh, okay. What does this mean for you as a C++ developers? So first thing you should do is keep your classes small. So inside your, so you, you, if you have a large class, you should figure out which of its data members are accessed often and have them as a separate class and move everything else into other classes. Because what happens in that case, when you're processing your smaller classes, you're loading the data from the memory to the cache line and remember the locality principle. So that means that you will load on to the cache line only the data that you're actually using. If your X, if your the, the hardware loads 64 bytes of data into the cache, but you're using only four bytes out of these 64 bytes of data, actually you're wasting system resources. So you should reorganize your data so that the, the system so to, to get better usage of the of the cache subsystems in this case. Um, I think yep. there, this is uh, like to, you, to take this recommendation to the extreme. It's the whole discussion about structure of arrays and array of structs where your class would be at the end of the day, it's extremely small and it's just part of what would logically be a larger class. But due to these kind of memory access patterns, you save a large array of RGB colors and not an array of objects, each of one which has a color. Exactly. And then you have to take care of, of uh, ensuring everything is aligned between your, your external. Exactly. Yes, so this is an extreme one, but it's uh, difficult to maintain that kind of con. But the good thing is when you're, you're keeping your classes small and you're creating, actually creating something called components. 
And these components are logical, logical uh, holes. So they're logical, they're uh, wholeness. So how to say, it? class is small. For example, you have a class student and he has a name and he has marks and so on. Name is rarely used and you can keep it in the other. You don't keep it part of the class if you want performance. And that will keep everything, everybody happy. And uh, why is the name? I mean, when you're processing marks, student marks, does it really matter if the marks belong to the student or they belong to the professor or they belong to the master student? If you are, have a program that, pro, that has a vehicle and inside vehicle has wheels, does it matter that wheels are wheels of a bus or wheels of a toy car? It doesn't matter, okay? So actually, if I may, so actually what you are saying is that things that are accessible together should be located together. Am I right? Yes, yes. You want to maximally use the cash line because this is the power where you'll see later the number. This is where the performance actually lies. So, I have one, one question. Uh, yeah. Does branch prediction messes your cash if it's wrong? Uh, branch prediction. So it's a complex topic and I don't think many people are familiar with branch prediction. Yes, branch prediction can make your program faster in cases there, there, are, there are a lot of cache misses, but it comes with a price and that is you have a, a larger cache trashing. So you're loading stuff into cache that you will never use. So, so it does. Okay, thanks. Yes, yes. So that's one thing. So keep your classes small. Declare data members inside your classes together that you access together close to each other. So this increases the likelihood that the data members will be in the same cache line. So imagine an example of a class rectangle and it has a point one and point, so left, left, top left point and the bottom right point. So this thing you will often use together to calculate surface and so on. So you want to keep them close to one another. You don't want to have a large gap between them with the other data members. Next thing, keep your small classes in a dedicated vector. Avoid processing small classes as part of larger classes. If you have a dedicated vector, not a vector which is a vector of pointers, vector of objects and a small class, you'll see a larger performance. You will see better performance. And when you're processing small vectors, you will be iterating over the dedicated vector, not over the large vector that has a pointer to the small vector. Don't use vector of points or use vector of values. Okay, so here's an ex experiment. Here's an experiment I did. There's a class rectangle. It has, one is called ball visible. We have a point top left and bottom right. And then I created these two paddings between visible and point one and also one padding at the end of the class. So you have two paddings. So I wanted to say, how does the perform? So have a look at this function. It's called calculate surface visible. It will go through a list of rectangles. And if the rectangle is visible, it will, cal it will calculate its surface and uh, accumulate it to this sum. Now, the question is, if the best runtime of this function calculate surface visible is x, what will be the worst runtime? Will be 2x, 3x, 5x. So you can you can place your bets in the chat window, but do it unofficially. Okay. Now the we will I, I modified the size of the padding one and the padding two. We wanted to see how does that influence performance. So here are the numbers. So the class is smallest when there is no padding either between pad one or pad two. So in this case, there were two functions actually. One is calculate surface visible and the other one was calculate surface all. In case of calculate surface visible, uh, the, the, the runtime of the functions on 20 million objects was around 100, and mil, 100 milliseconds, a bit 110 milliseconds. And as the size of the class grew, so it was 20 bytes at the beginning, but when the size of the class was 248 bytes, in that case, you could see the runtime was 200 milliseconds, okay? And the calculate surface saw, so we didn't touch the visible, we just cal were calculating surface. The best case was around 30 milliseconds and the worst case was around 150 milliseconds. So it was five times the difference. 
What I'm saying that the size of the class actually has a large impact impact on, on, on your performance. So in one case, it was five times. In the other case, it was two times. Now, that was one thing. The question, second question, how does the speed of processing data depends on the gap between member visible and member P1 and P2? Now, have a look at this again. I'm sorry to jump for jumping slides. You have a visible, then you have point one, then you have point two, and there is a padding here. So what happens if the, there is no padding or we are increasing padding? Have a look at the calculate surface visible function. So we are using visible and then we are using PA, P1 and P2 together. We are using them together. When we are accessing visible, we will also access P1 and P2. So here are the numbers. So the red line is for the calculate surface all and the calculate surface all doesn't use uh, doesn't use the the the, the, the is visible uh, the visibility ball, but as the padding grew, so the performance got worse. So at, it, ideally, it was around two hundred milliseconds, but as the as the padding between the the, the visible and the, the first point was growing, so was the performance was go going bad, and it was two hundred and fifty milliseconds. So this is not as bad as the previous example, but it also shows you that you should uh, you should put your data memories and your classes close to one another if you intend to use them together. That will really benefit performance. This this thing of this uh, padding was seen only on large class sizes. For example, this class size was 248. It wasn't visible on small class sizes. Okay, questions. By raising the padding size, you actually increase the size of the object. Uh, no, I was keeping, in this case, I was keeping the size of the object constant. I was increasing the padding one, but I was decreasing. OK, the with the other, with the other um, data member, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So what does this experiment uh, tell you about class size, data layout, and performance? As far as the performance is concerned, object-oriented paradigm is not very efficient. So you have a C++ has containers of pointers, which creates a lot of alloc and free. Uh, containers containing objects of different types. So you have an object which is a pointer to a base class, and then you are then you are, have one one object is 200 bytes, the other one is 300 bytes. So this makes him uh, this makes it difficult for the hardware to predict. The, to figure out the access pattern. And also you have large classes. Large classes is the problem that you're loading some things into, into, into cache memory. Remember, all the memory accesses go through cache memory, but you never actually use them. So in game development, so I'm not advocating for, for, for this thing. I'm just giving you an example. In game development, they use a paradigm called entity component systems. They don't use large classes. They use small classes. They got rid of inheritance. They don't use inheritance anymore. So how did they, how do they make objects, complex structures of objects? So they have these entities, which is which is just a number. So it is an ID, and each entity consists of components. And there, if if the ID of entity, so there is a component. There is a component manager. If the entity ID is present in the component in the component manager. That means that entity has that has that um, uh, has that component, and they're processing components. Entity is really something really abstract. You never see see it in code. Components are processed as independent of the entity they belong. So you can process you can process wheels that belong both to toy cars, and you can process wheels that belong to buses, and you can if. If this is, they require the same type of processing, then you can process in that, that way. And the nice thing about this approach is that entity can actually change their type because now the entity is really like, uh, la how say, lax. It's really light. So it doesn't, you can, if you add ID of the, of the entity in a component manager, that means that the entity gets a new behavior. So something that you don't see. These are the, the C++, the way the C++ is used that you rarely see, but this is how in gate development, they actually do this. So I don't think the world is moving towards uh, this paradigm, but there are some nice lessons that one, you, one can learn from having a look about 
entity component system paradigm and how these things works. Okay. When you say uh, get rid of inheritance, I think it, it means uh, runtime polymorphism. You can still use uh, private inheritance just like component system. There's no reason. It's just structs within structs. If it makes sense, you can use it. Um, of course, you still have to keep your data close, but uh, no. certain system, you could implement some of these things in, by composition, no? Yes, yes. So they're moving from inheritance to composition and the composition comes with some benefits and some drawbacks. I mean, uh, virtual virtual functions from the performance point of yeah, view. Yeah, okay, that's runtime polymorphism, but inheritance is just about composition and the, the runtime part. If you don't use the word, keyword virtual, then it's just about uh, aggregation. It's not about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yes, yes, yes. Okay. Okay, cache memories and prefetching. If the hardware can figure out the memory access pattern, it will prefetch data from main memory before the CPU even needs it. If you're accessing memory sequentially one by one, the prefetcher will figure this out. It will work forward and backward. So you have a vector and you're moving forward or backward, it doesn't matter. If the stride is constant, it can be one. So you're accessing neighboring elements or it can be more than one, like five, 10, 16 and so on. Uh, but from the performance point of view, the smaller the stride, the better the performance. I explain again why. So uh, next thing, example in the command line, I'm gonna give you an example and you should place bets. So if the runtime of stride one is X, how much is the runtime of stride 16 and how much is the runtime of random accesses? So let, let's have a look at the example. Let me show you the source code. Uh, okay. I create a random vector, which is of integer, which is 100 megabyte in size. And then I create a map which consists of zero, one, two, three, four, five. So it goes from one to 1,000 million, okay? And now I'm accessing, I'm measuring how much time does it need for me to go through this array and sum up all the elements of the array. Now, have a look at this line here. So to use the index, which index I'm going to use depends on the map array. So in this case, I'll be accessing array 0, 1, 2. In the next case, I'll be going backwards. Then I will go 0, 16, 24, and so on. And I, I, when I finish the end, I will just start from the beginning, 1, 17, and so on. And finally, I'll do a random shuffle. I'll shuffle the map array and see the performance. So, okay. So please place your bets. I'm just curious. There will be a performance penalty for this, but let's see how big it is. Uh, pop, 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 pop. This is really slow again. Anybody has any questions until this point? Okay. Uh, somebody asks here, uh, what is the third argument to STD generate? I have no idea. I don't remember. <laughs> Sorry. Your code. Can you show your code? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know why this works so slow. I'm using the, the, the computer that is really close to me. Is this somehow somewhat related to Zoom? Maybe, probably. Says so they generate map begin, map pen, n equals zero, then it says mutable. Oh, it's and the lambda, it's the lambda. It's a lambda, okay. Let's do it. Uh, oh God, this is so slow. I think Zoom is consuming all of the all of the bandwidth because I can under understand the the the. The system I'm logging into is in the same in the same household. It's ridiculous. But maybe we can speed reality by uh, twenty percent. Sorry. 
I've been trying to do it locally. But I want to do it uh, um, because I don't know how much CPU cycles does, does Zoom consume. Okay. Okay, let's do access pattern test. Okay, it took 227 milliseconds. Let's do it one more time. I hope I don't see a, a huge... Uh, 227, 228, okay. Now I'm gonna change from the, from the, from the, going zero, one, two, let's go backwards. So I think this case, it will be the same, 227, 228. Why? Huh? Is that related to the red black tree of the map? No, no, this is a vector. It's not a, it's oh, not a, it's still on the vector. It's a vector, so the because the hardware prefetcher doesn't care if you're going uh, from zero to n or n to zero. It doesn't matter. But let's do it like this instead of let's do it like this. Now I'm generating zero, six, in twenty-four, and so on. There's a question from the audience. Uh, will you come back to polymorphic objects stored in a vector at some point? Uh, polymorphic objects in a vector. Uh, okay, we can talk about that a bit later, okay? Okay, now this is tried 16. We are accessing every 16th integer in the array. So what happened? From 217, I went to 933. Okay, so you guess you see that uh, that the, the stride access uh, from two hundred and seventeen to nine hundred and thirty three. Now we had an array of integers and we were accessing six, every sixteen elements. But you can have the same the same effect you would have if you have a class which size is uh, sixteen times four, so it's uh, 10, 11, 64, 64 bytes, and the first element is integer and you're ex you're going through an array of these classes and you're accessing only the first first integer in the class you will have completely the same effect okay now what happens if we shuffle this thing so um, let's let's do the shuffling and see what happens. So because of the shuffling, it takes a bit longer. The time uh, management measurement that you take is, does not include the shuffling itself. No, no, it doesn't. So originally it took 215 milliseconds uh, with the with the strided axis it took 900 milliseconds so it was like four times slower and with the random axis it was again three times slower over that so how much three times 12 times slower yeah so in your C++ program if you're processing data if you're processing data just uh, going Linearly over classes, you will get some number like this. If the class is not too big, the smaller the class, the better the number. And this will you will get this if you are going, if you are visiting a binary tree or hash map where you are definitely going to have a, a, a hash map miss. The so, last one is because the prefetcher didn't predict right, and the cache was probably not containing the data. Both yeah, the yeah. Cache. The the, the 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 data set was 100 megabytes and this 
laptop has like four or six megabytes of L3 cache, so it doesn't fit. And in that case, when you are just randomly accessing the memory, that's why it was slower. Okay. Uh, so did you vote? Were there any interesting numbers on the chat? Uh, did anybody? Uh, no. Too bad. I want to pop up. Huh? Pop up. Okay. Mm, okay. Mm, moving to the next thing. So you saw the effects that your the effects that your program has on the, the effects it has on performance about the prefetching. Now the memory access pattern, CPU always works with simple types. It works with chars, integer, doubles, and floats. And that from the performance, from the perspective of CPU, there is no such thing as classes. They're just collections of chars and integers. Uh, the best thing when you're, the, the best from the performance perspective, the sequential access, when you're accessing neighboring simple types is the best performance. So you have a vector which is of integers and then you, you're summing them you go zero and it goes from zero to the vector size and then you're adding a, a of i. So you're adding to them to the sum. So this is the bad case. Next thing is triad access. Your x simple types in a vector or a class instances. Bad for, the, the for, bad for performance. The bigger the class, the worse the performance. You have, again, you have a vector of rectangles. Now the rectangles are from our previous example. Let's say they're 20 bytes in size. If you are summing them up like this, this will be slower, okay? We are summing all the visible rectangles. And the final, you have random access. You're randomly accessing objects in memory. You or typically will have this with the STD set, STD map, STD list. So hash maps, trees, they'll have, you, you'll have random access, especially the, I mean, the, the fact will be really visible when the size of your data structure is bigger than the size of your cache. And this typically a few megabytes. So again, you hear set rectangle. So we have a set of rectangle, and then we are using this for auto, for this advanced for how do you call it? Range estimation. Oh, sorry, for each range range for loop. range for to do the summation. This will be the slowest. <sighs> okay. From the other perspective, arrays, vectors with sequential access are the best way to process data. The referencing a pointer often creates memory cache miss and CPU stall. Valid for list trees, hash mass on. In C++, polymorphism is achieved using pointers. So you have this syntax for polymorphism as the vector of base class. This can be very efficient from a performance point of view. If the data set is large, more than a megabyte, it will not fit the data cache. We can expect a huge slowdown in those cases since memory pointed by the pointer doesn't necessarily has to be consecutive memory. You want point neighboring pointers in vector to point to neighboring objects in memory. This is the best case, but you won't get it every time. For small data structures that fit nicely into the cache, you will see very little performance gain or even for performance regressions. So all this talk is about really large data structures. You have like a data structure that's two, one or two kilobytes. All these things about the optimization don't make sense. It fits every your, your whole data set fits the data set fits the cache, so you don't see these problems. So here is the way optimal layout. Uh, arrays of pointers, optimal layout versus non-optimal layout. So you have here vector, which is a pointer to base class. So neighboring pointers point to the neighboring objects. And this is the optimal layout. If you iterate over this vector, we get the good performance. This is a non-optimal layout. So the next one, you see the first point, the first pointer points to the fifth object, the second pointer points to the second object and so on. This is a non-optimal layout. In the case of a large, of large, really, really large vector, the difference is be like 10 times. So this will be 10 times faster than this one. Okay. Uh, so array of values versus array of pointers. This is taken from an article from my site. It's called process polymorphic array lighting speeds. Arrays of values are, are much better for, for performance compared to array of pointers. 
all memory is allocated in a single block. So you don't have news and deletes. You don't have them, that's, that's really nice. You have sequential access to object translates to sequential access to memory addresses. So they are guaranteed to be sequential in memory if you're using vector of objects. Uh, no cost of alloc fee. Again, you don't have virtual dispatching mechanism to slow things down. So virtual functions add a, a, a overhead to, to your system, which can be small or large, can be really large, depends on what you do. So virtual dispatching is not something that, that, that costs free. Um, enable small function inlining because type is known at compile time. So this is also one thing. If you're using vector of object, the compiler can inline those functions and can make your code faster. Downside, there is no uh, polymorphism. However, it is possible to implement array of values with polymorphism. Check out the article. So typically, what C, if you ask C++, what do you want to do in the case you want to keep, you don't want a pointer of objects, you want you don't want that, you want something else. They will say use std variant, but std variant you don't have anymore. You don't have polymorphism, no no virtual functions. However, it is possible it is possible to keep create objects in the container originally and then convert them to object pointers. And you can access those object pointers, and then you can access them. You have polymorphism, and you have the, 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 the all the advantages of the vector of, of, of vector of objects. Okay, this finishes the talk about variants. Now we have two options. Now we can stop. In that case, I'll I'll uh, I'll. Uh, I, I think, I think or we need like ten or fifteen more minutes. No, maybe run. Let's do a poll. Okay, Paul. Oh wait, no, it's someone. Who can set up the poll? Okay. You can just quickly can? use the thumb up, maybe. Ivica, I have a question. Um, yes. Can you hear me? Uh, it, you mentioned that uh, if we uh, that you have uh, if if you allocate all the uh, members of an array of a polymorphic polymorphic array one after the other, then use an array of pointers to the objects that are next to each other, then performance is good. Um, yeah. So we, yeah. so does that technically something that can work for STD list as well? Like if I have a STD list with yes. my own allocator yeah. and I know yeah. yes, if you have a STD list and you are you're sure that if you're sure that uh, that the neighbor, neighboring elements in the list point to the neighboring chunks in memory, in that case, typically you will have good performance. But bear in mind, there is no guarantee about that. And the people why use people use linked lists because they can remove elements from them. And when they remove them and they add new and then remove and they add new, these things get messy. And then you just the, the performance just slides away. The speed it gets slower and slower and slower, and if it's a long-lived structure, it can get really slow. Okay, what did we decide? Okay, so in the reactions, we have there's a, like a green checkbox and a red X, assuming you you have the latest Zoom version. So if you want to stay, you can stay willing to stay 15 more minutes. Use the green X. If you had, uh, if you have a lot to think about and need to process for about a month. So use the red X, okay? So now, and then we can count them. So this is the last example is actually about the binary tree. So that's a structure used for fast lookup, but the way we allocate chunks of memory for the tree can actually impact the performance and it can even impact the impact it in a significant ways, not simple ways. It's not like 10%, it's like two times faster. So I, I think we have six green check marks and I see 20 people. So it's just under a third. I think we should uh, strive to towards a conclusion and uh, we'll I will say, yeah, I know some people can't vote. It depends on your version of, of Zoom. So you can write a blog about a, a pain. So if you open the participants window, 
In the participants view, you have the green and red buttons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. I, I think we can start. Okay, we've got eight, nine. Okay, let's keep it. Okay, let's do it. Okay. I think this okay. is the funny. It, this is an interesting part. So you you'll see you'll learn something new. So a question before we, we continue, if I may. Yes. Uh, you spoke about uh, vector of uh, structs versus uh, struct of uh, vectors uh, or, or arrays. Um, it depends on the operation that you want to, to perform. If we want to run over the uh, array of structs and the operation depends on many values in the struct, then I presume having the struct as is as, and not uh, breaking it into uh, array of members would be more efficient. I the the good thing about uh, struct of arrays is that uh, with struct of the arrays you can actually the compiler will compile your code with simd so with vector vec will generate vector arrays code and this can have again a lot of performance improvement. This can bring a lot of performance improvement. Okay. So, so you say even if I need to uh, perform operations on what I would call the same object, which is now se separated into different arrays, yes, which are not continuous in memory, it yes. will be still more efficient, or at least efficient as in struct. Uh, I you need to measure that. So array of structs, a struct of arrays are really really good for performance, but it's difficult to maintain, and you rarely see that. I never saw that in actually production code. Okay. Thanks. Moving to binary trees. So what's a binary tree? A data structure used for fast lookup to check if the value is present in. Uh, to check if the value is present in the binary tree to insert or remove it. So we have a binary tree here. We go eight, we're looking for example, for number seven. We go to the root of the tree, which is eight. If the value we're looking for is smaller than the current node, we go left, otherwise we go right. So seven is smaller, then we go left. Seven is larger than three, we go right. Seven is larger than six, we go right. And here we found our number three. So this is how binary trees work. How they implement it, you have a structure node, which has a value and then have pointer to the left and pointer to the right. Right, now what's the problem here? Memory is one dimensional, whereas binary layout structure is two dimensional. Question is how to optimally represent this memory structure in memory. So, if you have a look at this, if you have a look on the right side, this is a binary tree. Now you have three in-memory representation. One is the BFS order, so breadth first search. The other one is DFS order, depth first search. And the one one is a random order. So BFS, first we take a, on the level zero, eight, then five and 11 on the level one, and then take three, seven, nine, and so on on the level two. DFS order, we take eight, then we take five, then we take three, then we take seven, then we take eight, 11, then we take nine, and finally we take 13. And the random order is just any order. So question is, which one is faster? So I'm not going to want to bet, but there is no time for that. Uh, we can, I have an example here. So let's run it. Okay. Now this one gives you an example of memory layouts, BFS and DFS. So we can have a look. So just let, have a look at the source code. What is that, does it do? Let's see. It creates a binary search tree and then uh, it adds data to it, it's I think 10 million maybe, 
at 10 milliData to it, and then it tries to find the data inside the tree and measure how much time does it need to find 10 million data. Okay, now, so this is main and I'll type, for example, DFS, depth for search, and I can specify the allocator. I'll use, I'll use uh, built-in allocator. So I'm not using any custom allocators, I'm using built-in allocators and see how much does this thing need to complete. So built-in is just using regular new and deletes or malloc entries. So it took 11 seconds. Now what happens if I use a custom allocator, which I know it, it gives certain guarantees, it will return two calls to malloc, will return neighboring chunks. So let's see how, how does it behave in that case. So it went from 11 seconds to nine seconds. So it was two seconds faster just for using a custom allocator because it didn't mix up with the other, with a light custom allocator, which is not too common. Now this is the depth first search. Let's measure the breadth first search. So which one do you think will be faster, depth first search or breadth first search? Okay, depth first search took nine seconds. Breadth first, breadth first search took 15 seconds. It's a 15 second difference. So why do you think is the breadth first search? Why do you think that uh, this, this first order is so much better than the second order? Now, why do you think that the second order is so much better than the first order? So this one is the winner. This one was it's 10 because... seconds and the other one is 15. Because the search is always down the tree. It's always into the depth. It's never crosswise. So you have no value for putting same level nodes and close together. On the contrary, you want to keep them as far apart as you can. Yes, so the, the reason is that if you, in case of your, if this is your node here, you're, you're guaranteed that the left side will be neighboring in memory. So neighbors of five is three and it is neighboring memory. Neighbor of 11 is nine, they're neighbors. Neighbor of left side of eight is five and they're neighbors in memory. And this is the effect of cache lines. So you loaded eight, but you can probably also picked up five. And this has a really important impact on performance. There is an even a better one. It's called Van M. de Bois layout. So they're allocating in groups like this for three nodes. So they, they, they get, guarantee if you load number one, you'll get two and you'll get three too. So you get both of them in the, if they share the same cache line. And you can see the performance different there. How it's called? I think I called it VB, something like that. So this is another layout. So the, the DFS took almost 10 seconds, the BFS took 15 seconds, and this one will take less than 10 seconds. Let's see how much. This one took nine seconds. So it's not a big difference, but it's a difference. Now, this is this is the reason. You can also you can also use the uh, STD set. So STD set will be much worse, but one of the reasons why the STD set is bad is because it has more data in each, in each node. It has 40 bytes and my implementation has only 24. So it's a difference and it makes a difference. Bigger the class, the lower the performance. That is, that is what, what typically happens. Mm. Oh boy. Any questions? Interesting. What's Puppy? A Puppy, Lead Puppy is a library uh, on Linux that allows you to access performance counters so you can get information about cache, bench prediction, missing such stuff. 
So you see the STD set took 22, 22 seconds compared to this, this one, which took only nine seconds. Do you know an idea how to speed up this thing even further? Let me show you, it's really stupid. But if you do it like this, if I open make file and compile my program with M32, What will happen is that the pointers that were originally six, uh, eight bytes will now become four bytes. And the size of the class will become smaller. And this will have impact on performance. Smaller classes means better cache usage and so on. So I'll, I'll show you then. Uh, I'm gonna use the same line as this one. Oh, sorry, sorry, it doesn't work. Oh, 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 oh man, a couple, of, okay, I cannot fix this right now. But let me assure you, if you recompile your program which has many data cache misses, which is using memory randomly, if you recompile it for 32-bit architectures, in that case, you can get better performance. Now, so now, now this brings an idea. So why are we using pointers? Can we not have an, a, a vector and then offset inside that vector? And that's also a good idea. Um, okay, present. So we gain performance if, in case of this binary tree, we allocate a dedicated block of memory for the data structures. So we have a single block, that means we won't have any blocks that are far away in memory. So this, this, the, this fact alone brings some performance. We can achieve this only with a custom allocator. Uh, we try to keep the block of memory as compact as possible, I already explained it. We take advantage of cache line organization. If two nodes are adjacent in the tree and they're adjacent in memory, there is a high probability they will share the same cache line. If they do share the same cache line, we get the access with no cache miss. So we need to also take advantage of the prefetchers. Uh, if the two nodes are adjacent in tree and also adjacent in memory, increase the likelihood that the prefetcher gets activated. We need to keep struct node as compact as possible. If we recompile it for a 32-bit system, we can improve speed due to the better cache line use. In the 64-bit systems, only 48 bits inside the pointers are actually used, which allows you to merge two pointers and, and uh, decrease the size of the structure. This actually has impact on performance because it will decrease the size of the structure by, by, by four bytes. And if the st structure is small as it, our case was, this will make our program faster. So the, what happens with the binary tree modification? Adding and removing nodes slowly makes the memory, memory layout less and less optimal. After some time, the accesses become slower and slower. So what are the solutions? Recreate the data structure, which is optimal again, or defragment the existing data structure, which is more complex. One thing is that you should don't delete nodes and keep them around for some time in case they can be reused later. Okay. I'm skipping this example. So this is the end of the talk. I'm just going to give a conclusion. The memory bottleneck is the one thing that's limiting performance of your program, not the computational, uh, computational background. This is specifically in C++, business applications, stuff like that. This is the things that really memory access is not, not computation. This is not high performance computing. Careful design can help mitigate some of these problems if the performance is important. So prefer vectors of values whenever possible. Object-oriented design is not performance friendly, so investigate other things like entity component system, data-oriented design. Electronic cards, the game developer had, have their own implementation of STL, which focuses on for performance. If you want, you can have a look at how they implemented their stuff and just copy some of the ideas. Just Google EASTL for more information. Okay, that's the end. Can you please go to this page and fill out this survey because I know I want to know how to make this talk better next time.